Hi everyone, welcome back to our Ancient Persia video lectures. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, the first uh, beginning of warfare between the Persian Empire and the Greek world, uh, the Ionian Revolt, which lasted from 499 to 493 BCE, uh, and set the stage for the later Persian invasions of mainland Greece. Uh, you have the, the basic information uh, about the beginnings of Persian-Greek relations, the Ionian Revolt and the Persian Wars, uh, in uh, your textbook uh, and in uh, Herodotus's narrative, the, the main original source for these events. So what I want to do in this video talk is to try to focus on some key aspects uh, of the Persian-Greek military encounter. Uh, we're going to try to think about uh, some of the main factors uh, in Persia's responses to the Ionian Revolt, uh, as well as the revolt's uh, causes. Um, why do the Persians uh, take so long to put it down? Um, but how are they able to build on the empire's strengths uh, in order to uh, eventually coordinate a successful military response? So uh, the first thing we need to think about uh, is Persia's relationship with the uh, Greek cities on its northwestern frontier. Uh, you'll know that there is no united country of Greece uh, in the ancient world. There are many Greeks. Uh, there are uh, many, many hundreds of Greek city-states in the eastern Mediterranean world, uh, each one identifying uh, primarily as a community within its own city borders. Uh, the Persians take over hundreds of Greek city-states, and they number them among the dozens of different subject groups in their empire. Uh, to the Persians, they are known as the Yauna, uh, that is uh, in Greek, Ionian. Uh, when we look at Greek history, we refer to Ionia or the Ionian Greeks to refer to the easternmost Greek city-states, uh, those that line the coast of Anatolia or modern-day Turkey. Uh, but the Persians take that uh, regional name for the nearest uh, residing Greek city-states uh, and apply it to Greeks in general. Uh, in a few royal inscriptions, they talk about Yauna and the Yauna across the sea. Uh, that is, the city-states on the other side of the Aegean, which include the famous uh, great cities of Athens uh, and Sparta. From a Persian perspective, uh, the Persian Empire uh, exerts direct control from the satrapy of Sardis uh, over the nearby Yauna. Uh, there are about a dozen major uh, Ionian city-states uh, along the Anatolian coast or the islands just offshore. Uh, and the satrap at Sardis, uh, who in the late 500s and early 400s is Darius's brother, Artaphernes, uh, collects tribute from these Greek city-states. Uh, most of them are run uh, by local city rulers, uh, referred to in Greek as uh, uh, tyrannoi, tyrants, uh, although the word does not yet have the full negative uh, characteristics uh, that it does uh, come to possess. The satrap uh, enjoys direct communications uh, with the tyrants or city rulers uh, of each of these major uh, city-states. Uh, and basically, you know, they're worked into the administrative system uh, of the Persian Empire. On the other hand, um, Beyond the dozen or so large Ionian city-states, there are also at least 200 small Greek towns and villages uh, that are uh, located uh, around their margins and, and in their orbit. Uh, there are more Greek city-states out in the islands in the central Aegean Sea. Uh, and over those islands, and especially the Yauna across the sea, the Persians don't exert direct control. Uh, however, uh, they receive embassies from some of them, they receive political fugitives uh, from some of them who show up at Sardis to ask the satrap for favors. Uh, and Persia basically claims to rule the Greeks across the sea uh, through influence, if not through direct administrative control. The best example that we see of this before the Ionian Revolt is Persia's early relations with Athens, uh, which really begin uh, just after the year 507. BCE, uh, the same time uh, that we see Greek Kurtash being brought from the Ionian frontier uh, to the Persepolis region. In 511, uh, Athens had uh, experienced an upheaval, 
in which the people rose up and with Spartan aid, they overthrew their tyrant, uh, a man named Hippias. Hippias escaped Athens uh, and fled uh, to Anatolia, uh, where he became a political exile living under Persian protection. Uh, eventually, he's forwarded up to Susa, uh, where he goes and lives at Darius's court. Uh, in 507, four years after they uh, have their tyrant expelled with Spartan help, the Athenian people rose up uh, and founded a new system of government called democracy. Uh, the new democracy quickly quarrels with the Spartans, uh, and Athens' democracy comes into being uh, immediately facing a war, uh, facing a threat from a larger Greek city-state. In this crisis, Herodotus tells us that the Athenians sent an embassy to Sardis, uh, and they asked Artaphernes, King Darius's brother, for an alliance with the Persian Empire. In exchange, Artaphernes uh, said that you have to give us a symbolic gift of earth and water. Uh, this seems to be a gift which for the Persians uh, symbolized the, the total giving of one's territory uh, into the possession and protection of the great king. From the Persian point of view, Athens is now going to become a uh, Persian overseas client city. Now, Herodotus describes the incident in ambiguous language. Uh, he says that the ambassadors were willing to give this gift, but that uh, they were much blamed for this when they returned home to Athens. It seems from an Athenian point of view, uh, Athens did not surrender to Persia at this time, decided uh, that maybe it could back off uh, from full membership in the Persian Empire. They don't seem to have actually delivered a gift of earth and water. Uh, but from the Persian point of view, many scholars believe that at this moment in 507, the Persians uh, accepted Athens as a client. Uh, and Artaphernes could view the Athenians who had asked for help uh, as uh, in some way becoming uh, Persian subjects. Now, that would potentially play into the dynamics that followed between Persia and Athens. There are some scholars who believe that Persia regarded uh, Athens as its subject, and therefore, later on, when it helped the Ionian Greeks against Persia, uh, that Athens could be regarded as a rebel state, uh, maybe even a representative of the lie, uh, as we've seen uh, the rebels at Bisutun. Now, the Ionian revolt proper uh, broke out in 499. Uh, Persia had ruled Ionian Greek cities for 40 years without major rebellions, without major violence after the initial conquest. Uh, some Ionian cities uh, had continued to uh, uh, own a wealthy trade uh, and to do quite well for themselves under Persian rule. Uh, the most prosperous of the cities seems to have been the Ionian city of Miletus, uh, where the revolt actually broke out. Uh, it's ironic that the revolt seems to have begun in Persia's most favored Greek community, uh, where they expected at least. Uh, the sequence of events that leads into the revolt and the actual chronology uh, are a little bit fuzzy in Herodotus's account. They, they leave a number of questions. Uh, but this is what we can reconstruct about the basic framework. Um, Miletus had a, uh, a tyrant named Histiaeus, uh, who was highly favored by Darius. Uh, at a certain point in the late 500s, he was invited to go back to Darius's court and live at Susa uh, as a royal advisor on Greek affairs. His son-in-law, a man named Aristagoras, became the new tyrant of Miletus, and he kept up friendly relations with the Persian satrap. But in 499, uh, Aristagoras, the tyrant of Miletus, and several other Greek city rulers joined forces with uh, the Persians to try to capture one of the Greek islands. Uh, an island called Naxos in the central Aegean. The operation went wrong uh, somehow. Herodotus claims that there is uh, treachery involved. Uh, Persian forces, uh, Persian-owned uh, ships, but also Ionian Greek ships and troops, sailed out to Naxos, besieged it for four months, uh, and failed to capture the city. Uh, and at the end of 499, or the end of fall in 499, uh, they sail back to the uh, Bay of Miletus. At this point, we're told that Aristagoras uh, was afraid the Persians would blame him for this failed military operation. Therefore, he seized control of the fleet. He called on all Ionian Greek cities to overthrow their tyrants and set up democracies 
uh, and he laid down his tyranny himself uh, and proclaimed a democracy at Miletus. Uh, at this point, the Ionian revolt begins. There seems to be some confusion among the Persians, maybe some initial negotiations as they try to react uh, to the situation. Aristagoras, uh, in the winter of 499 to 498, traveled across the Aegean to mainland Greece, uh, and he asked for help at Sparta and Athens. Sparta said no. Athens said yes, and promised a small number of troops and ships to support the Ionian rebels. The next spring, uh, probably May or June 498, a group of Ionian Greek uh, rebel soldiers uh, joins forces with overseas Greeks from Athens at a smaller city called Eretria. Uh, and together, several thousand rebel Greeks assemble at the city of Ephesus. They march inland to Sardis, uh, capture the outer city at Sardis by surprise, and set it on fire. However, Artaphernes, the satrap, rallies Persian troops who counterattack and repel the rebels. Uh, they retreat back down to the coast and then are chased by Persian forces and defeated again. Athens, at this point, ceases all aid to the revolt, uh, and Athenian forces are not involved for the next several years of fighting. Now, once the rebels have attacked and uh, burned and damaged Sardis, uh, the news of the revolt spreads uh, around the coastline of Anatolia. Extra Greek and Carian communities join, and the island of Cyprus, uh, far away in the eastern Mediterranean, uh, also rises up in revolt against Persia. So King Darius faces uh, a major conflagration, uh, a rebellion uh, a very long way from the center of his empire. Uh, and we can tell from the Persepolis tablets um, where we see forces moving to India and Bactria in the same years that the Persians also have some other priorities. Uh, clearly, Greece would not be the only concern of Darius uh, at this time. Darius himself uh, is in uh, back and forth between Susa and Persepolis. Uh, so between 1,600 miles and 2,000 miles away from the epicenter of the revolt at Miletus. Uh, he orchestrates you know, a, a military response. Uh, and we see a, a series of Persian actions from 498 uh, down to 493 for five years that ultimately completely crush uh, the Ionian revolt. So a few things that we need to think about uh, for understanding the revolt and, and how it plays out. First of all, the causes from uh, the Ionian Greek perspective. Herodotus's version is all about the tyrants of Miletus. Histiaeus is described as secretly plotting and sending secret letters down the royal road uh, to encourage Miletus to revolt, supposedly because he's homesick in Susa and wants a rebellion at home so he can be sent home to put it down. Uh, most scholars regard this as a fanciful tale by Herodotus and, and don't give it a lot of credibility. Um, Aristagoras, who's actually at Miletus and involved in the rebellion's outbreak, is clearly a ringleader. But the question is um, why the rebellion spreads outside Miletus himself. Herodotus focuses on Aristagoras's individual motives and fears but that doesn't really tell us why the other Milesians or the other Greek communities would have anything to do with uh, challenging the military power of Persia. So modern scholars have uh, tried to make a number of educated guesses uh, about the factors that could actually cause a, a much larger regional rebellion. Um, it used to be popular in the 20th century to suggest that economic motives must be uh, at stake, um, but we don't really have any concrete evidence uh, for uh, a reaction to Persian taxes uh, as a factor in this particular rebellion. It, it's possible, uh, but it can't be proven. Um, we don't really have anything that tells us uh, that Greek cities were paying more to Persia in tribute than they had been paying to uh, Lydia in tribute. Clearly Greek elites, especially in Miletus and other wealthy cities, uh, were pretty prosperous at the time of the rebellion. Uh, so economic motives uh, alone don't seem to be a, a good explanation. Uh, a more popular theory that, that is uh, more lasting is the idea that tyranny as a system of government 
was starting to fall into disfavor in much of the Greek world. Uh, tyrannies had become less common in, in mainland Greece in the late 500s. In many places, they had given way uh, to moderate oligarchies. Uh, in Athens, they had surprisingly uh, given way to this new uh, democratic form of government. Uh, it's clear that within the decade that followed Athens setting up a democracy, uh, that may have set a trend. Uh, there may be a popularity of this concept of popular government, uh, and that might be why Aristagoras, uh, a tyrant in trouble, decided it was a safer move to lay down his power uh, and try to bid for a leadership position uh, among uh, a newly empowered people. Um, so many scholars think that uh, Ionian Greeks resented their own tyrants, uh, and uh, they overthrew tyrants in many Ionian Greek cities who then fled to the Persians. Uh, many scholars think the tyrants were being propped up in Ionia by Persian support. Uh, and so anti-tyrant sentiment then might have translated to anti-Persian sentiment. Uh, however, it's also possible that there are other uh, factors at, at play. Um, the Persepolis tablets give us some food for thought. In the simultaneous movement of large numbers of Greek kurtash from the frontier to the center. Um, it's been suggested, and I'm, I'm sympathetic to the idea, uh, that there may be a greater popular resentment of Persia uh, than Herodotus, uh, say, recognizes in his focus on the elite because of these sorts of uh, large-scale movements. Uh, which take uh, large numbers of Greek men, women, and children from the frontier, uh, move them 2,000 miles away to what must have seemed like the ends of the earth. Uh, it would be natural for that to spark anti-imperial resentment uh, that maybe we don't see in our texts that focus more on uh, the leaders uh, at play. So the Persian response to the revolt uh, is very interesting. Darius is not going to go in person uh, to the frontier to put this thing down. But he does take some steps to try to assert personal leadership. Uh, although he's going to manage the military campaigns long distance uh, through uh, the messenger system, we see that the man on the scene in Sardis who coordinates initial response is the king's brother, Artaphernes. Uh, when Persian armies are sent, when reinforcements are sent from central Anatolia to the coast to counterattack against the rebels, to, to counterattack against the rebels, uh, three of the generals in charge of these armies are sons-in-law of King Darius. Uh, and at a later date, when Persians start to uh, expand their forces, retake the Aegean Islands and campaign across the sea, then we see another royal son-in-law, uh, the general Mardonius, son of Gauberuva, who uh, also marries a daughter of Darius. Um, by acting through his sons-in-law, Darius could maybe assert a sort of family authority over military campaigns uh, on the Greek frontier. We see this in other empires as well, notably in the Roman Empire, uh, in its early wars uh, in the reign of Augustus on the German frontier. Uh, Augustus, the Roman emperor, similarly would uh, not go to the frontier uh, in the German wars, but he would rely on his stepsons uh, and on other members of the extended imperial family to make sure that glory is not going to generals uh, outside his uh, own dynastic circle. Uh, I think in the same way, Darius uh, is trying to have it both ways, to stay in the center, manage the overall empire and all its concerns, but make sure that a military campaign uh, that gives prestige to those who lead it is associated with uh, the, the inner circle of the Achaemenid family. Now, Darius's uh, messenger system, his logistics and communication system, uh, are vitally important in the Persian response to the revolt. Uh, Persian responses are methodical. We see in 498, uh, and probably through 496, uh, multiple armies of uh, several thousand soldiers each uh, are campaigning at several different points in western Anatolia. Uh, simultaneously. The, the Persians send columns to attack different parts of uh, rebel territory, isolate them from one another, uh, and retake major cities one by one, while also probably trying to negotiate uh, with those that are on the fence about the rebellion in the first place. 
uh, in 497. Uh, while we know from Babylonian records that Darius is spending much of the year in Babylon, uh, there's a major Persian offensive in Cyprus. Uh, Persian ships from other parts of the Eastern Mediterranean, from Egypt and Phoenicia and Cilicia, um, land an army in Cyprus. It wins a battle, although it loses a naval battle offshore to Cypria and Ionian ships. Uh, it wins on land. Uh, and then we have good archaeological evidence, as well as Herodotus, uh, that uh, illustrates the recapture of Cyprus's cities. Once Cyprus falls, the Persians add that to their naval bases in the eastern Mediterranean, uh, and in 495 to 494 uh, we see a remarkable uh, volume of messenger exchanges between uh, Persepolis, Sardis, uh, and also some other uh, unspecified locations that seem to be in the eastern Mediterranean region. Um, these are the subject of a, an article that I wrote up last year in a, a journal called Historia, uh, where I argue that these messenger exchanges, uh, based on their dates and locations, uh, seem to be associated with, with the Persian response to the rebellion. Basically, um, Darius is able to use the messenger system to synchronize movement between components of the Persian military in different locations uh, at the same time. Uh, essentially all across the eastern Mediterranean front. Uh, he can coordinate land and naval forces through these fast-moving messengers who take only 12 days or so uh, to get to the bases uh, that he's trying to communicate with. Uh, so that messenger system was crucial to Darius's uh, coordination of a fleet from Egypt, Phoenicia, and Cyprus, uh, and a land army from Sardis. Uh, these combined forces, they join uh, in the summer of 494, uh, off Miletus. They win the naval battle of Lade in fall 494 and destroy the rebel Ionian fleet, uh, and then they besiege and recapture Miletus itself, the rebellion's epicenter, uh, in the fall and maybe into the winter uh, of 494. So the aftermath of the rebellion, uh, of course, involved reasserting Persian authority over the frontier, uh, and that's going to happen in several ways. Uh, on the one hand, the Persians show remarkable lenience after they've made examples of a few rebel centers. Miletus is burned, is heavily depopulated. Uh, thousands of Milesians are deported to the center of the empire. We hear that all of the young men in Miletus are supposedly castrated uh, to punish the city uh, for its rebellion. Uh, but the other Ionian cities uh, are then invited to send messengers to the satrap at Sardis, uh, and they're given a peace settlement in 493 uh, that Herodotus says was a really good deal for Ionia. Uh, they are uh, not, they don't have their tribute raised. Uh, they're brought back into the empire. Uh, the Persians set up measures uh, for treaties between Ionian cities uh, and arbitration when there are disputes between Ionian cities and basically present themselves as the peacemakers between quarreling Greeks. Uh, and strangely uh, enough, the, the Persians uh, in 492 allow a large number of Greek cities to replace their tyrants with democracies. Uh, so the Persian response seems to be pragmatic, uh, to give the Ionians some incentives for coming back into the fold uh, after making examples of a few bad apples. At the same time, the Persians are preparing large military campaigns against the overseas Greeks who had helped the Ionian rebels. These culminate in the attack on Athens in 490 uh, and the surprise Athenian victory against the Persian invaders uh, at the Battle of Marathon. Uh, Darius sends uh, an army with a fleet across the sea. They land at Marathon on Athenian soil. Uh, they're preparing to, they bring with them Hippias, the elderly former tyrant, who they're going to put back in power at Athens. Uh, and of course, the Athenians rally, uh, defeat the Persians on the beach, uh, and uh, save their democracy and, and prevent that from happening. Um, what's really interesting about the Marathon campaign from the imperial perspective uh, is that the Persians draft Ionian Greek forces uh, into probably the fleet as well as the army in the campaign. And there seems to be this sense that they're punishing Athens for helping the rebels, but also using a war against Athens to reintegrate the rebels uh, into imperial society. Uh, 
From the Persian point of view, the campaign against Athens can be a loyalty test for Ionians who help the empire punish these faraway offenders. We don't know if Persia intended to start administration on a Persepolis model across the sea in Greece. Uh, we don't have evidence that there's going to be a satrap of Greece if the Persians win at Marathon. Uh, rather, it seems they're trying to set up Greek clients in overseas cities, maybe increase their influence across the sea. But part of the objective uh, seems to be the res restoration of order uh, in Ionia itself. Now, why did the Persians lose the Battle of Marathon? Uh, this is the million dollar question. Uh, Herodotus' account is very brief. The description of the battle in Herodotus is only a, a paragraph long, uh, and we have no sources for the Persian perspective. However, we should be careful, uh, skeptical of uh, Greek sources and then uh, modern popular accounts uh, based on late Greek sources uh, that suggest that the Persians are militarily inferior uh, to the militia uh, of the city of Athens. Uh, one detail Herodotus does mention is that ethnic Persian infantry who were stationed in the center of the Persian army broke through uh, the Greek soldiers facing them and pursued them for some distance before the Athenians won on the wings, started to encircle the Persians, uh, and won the battle. We don't know where the uh, Ionian Greek conscripts were in the Persian army, uh, but if they weren't in the center, where the ethnic Persians were, it stands to reason that some Ionian Greeks may have fought against some Athenian Greeks and lost, uh, and that may have played a role uh, in the outcome of the Marathon battle. Um, we're engaged in guesswork here, but uh, there is some evidence that Persians were capable of fighting and defeating Greeks in battle. Uh, the battles of the Ionian Revolt illustrate that. Uh, so Marathon itself, uh, remains something of a mystery. Uh, the Athenians certainly uh, took advantage of the situation. They managed to win under desperate circumstances with their backs to the wall. Uh, but we shouldn't assume that any Persian military attack on Greece uh, is automatically doomed to tactical failure. That's all for today. When we come back next time, uh, we're going to talk about Xerxes' invasion of Greece.